All right. Well, we are in this uh, rather lengthy discussion on enterprise systems, which is just kind of uh, setting the foundation for a lot of things that we will uh, be talking about here over the course of the next couple of class periods and really laying a foundation for the semester. Probably the biggest thing that we talked about last time was how um, enterprise resource planning systems and really in a broader context how enterprise information <laughs> systems in general have evolved over the last Really, at this point, it would be about four and a half, almost coming up on five decades of their use in business. And we left off talking about the fact that in contemporary software development architectures, what a lot of companies are embracing is this idea of developing in terms of, and let me get my pen working here, developing in terms of I can write with my finger, but not with my pen. So there we go, web services. And so we talked about last time the concept behind uh, service-oriented architecture. And, and that is where we will, we will pick up in our discussion today. The idea here is that you will see, um, hang on a second, <coughs> let me, let me, uh, get PowerPoint under control here. I don't know why this happens from time to time, but it does. One of these days, Microsoft will make a technology that doesn't decide to flake out at the last minute at like the worst possible time. Um, they have not yet mastered that. There we go. Okay, so now let me erase that and let's, there we go. Okay, so service-oriented architecture. Contemporary enterprise applications are embracing this idea of service-oriented architecture. And so the idea here is that when software developers are sitting down to write applications, they don't think of, first of all, of writing a monolithic application like we saw with the first generation of <coughs> SAP ERP. They think in terms of writing these multi-tiered applications like we talked about where R3 was an example of a three-tiered application. And then beyond that, they think in terms of the idea of writing our software such that it is a collection of services that do different things that provide functionality to other parts of the system. So for example, we might create a module, and I'll put this on the slide here so that we have it. We might create a programmatic module that is named Price Lookup. And the way this particular module would work would be you would pass it a material number and a customer <coughs> number and it would return back to you I'll just put it coming out the other side here. It would pass back to you the price that that customer would pay for that particular material. That would be a very, very simple service. You pass it information, it passes information back to you. Well, what we do when we create our software is we think in terms of, okay, what are all the different modules like this that we could create? What are all the different services that we could create? And the idea behind this is, once I create this service, now this could be reused in many, many different places throughout the application. We might have a marketing application that we're writing and it would need this functionality. We might have a pricing application. We might have some things in terms of logistics. This kind of functionality would be generically useful to us in many, many different specific applications. But we write this service one time and then it makes that functionality available to any other part of our system that would want to employ this. Now we won't get into the really, really technical 
uh, implementation of how this works, but the web services architecture that's a part of the service-oriented architecture follows a request-response protocol, meaning you ask a question or you pass information to a given service and it responds with, with an answer. And the way it does that is it uses protocols that are already in existence and very well known and reliable in computing architecture. HTTP is the transport protocol used by the World Wide Web. And so when you send a message to a service module, you send it basically using the same kind of technology as you <coughs> use when you are requesting a web page. So just like you type in an address, hit enter, and you get back a web page, that's kind of the same thing here. You're passing information to a module in the form of a request, and it's sending back a response. Now, on the web, web pages are at least typically HTML. Well, the response that you get back from a web service is XML. HTML and XML are both markup languages, but they kind of serve two very different roles. XML is more for information transmission. So what happens here is when you want to request, in my example, a price lookup, you create an XML document that's very, very simple. It just contains a material number and a customer number. You send it to this address where this web service is deployed and it responds with a XML document that has your price in it. So that's the logistics that we're looking at here. And there are places online that you could go to see an example of this. Some of these are kind of flaky as far as how they actually work, but the uh, National Weather Service has an example of this. And uh, let me see if I can remember where I go to actually run this example. Go to the following URL. All right, let's try this. Okay, so I want to find out the weather. Let's see, that's latitude and longitude. That's not what I want. Let's see if this one. <coughs> that's the <coughs> Let's go to my other example here. That's the wrong document. It's not on Yahoo. This servicerepository.com is a, a public location where a lot of these web services are listed. And, and some of them don't behave real great. But we'll see if we can get this to work. Now, in theory, what's going to happen here is I'm going to use this get weather service. So I, in order to use get weather, what I have to do is I have to pass it, I believe, a zip code, and it sends back or actually I pass it the name of a city and it passes going to pass me back the weather in that city. Now I don't know if it has Johnson City or not so I'm going to pass it Atlanta and notice country I can leave that blank or I could put in a country I'm gonna let it figure out where Atlanta is it should be able to do that so I send just the city name Atlanta to this service and I get back this in response. What I should have gotten back if this were working, and this website is well known for being really, really flaky, I should have gotten back, so you can envision here, a, a document that tells me what the weather is in Atlanta right now, which let's just assume it's like 137 degrees and sunny, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's the way this should work, and unfortunately I can't show you that example, but it's this idea of request and, and response. Well, let's talk for just a second here before we leave this topic about why this is the way a lot of software is being architected anymore. And, and by the way, as an aside, so what happens is when you buy SAP ERP, as you will see on the next slide, you are going to get a service repository. And in that service repository are a whole host of these web services. And when I say a whole host, 
I'm talking tens of thousands of them, okay? And you can search through, and you might say, for example, I want a service that will let me find out a customer's account number. And I want to be able to pass that service the name of a customer and their address and have it pass back to me the, the customer number based on that. Th there's a service in there that will do that. So if you think about it, Almost every piece of functionality that you can engage in <coughs> from the keyboard by way of the SAP GUI, you could also engage in by way of this service repository. <coughs> so wh why do we do that? What's the advantage of that? Well, what this does, one of the things that this does from us, from a computational point of view, is it gives us what is often called versatility through encapsulation. Now what this means is I could be a software developer and I could write an application that would leverage this ability to look up customer account numbers without really knowing exactly how that works. All I know is I call the service and I pass it this and it passes me back this. What's actually happening inside of the service is kind of a black box. I don't know what happens inside of it. I just know I feed it this and it gives me back this response and, and it works. So because of that, this piece of functionality, in our example here, price lookup, has been encapsulated. I used the example last week of it's almost like a building block or a Lego piece where I can now take that and put it in lots of different places and it works. And I can rely on it to always give me back the information that I'm looking for. So it gives me a lot of versatility. I can use that many, many different places because I know that that particular building block does just one thing but it does it really, really, really well. Tied to that, and this is another uh, more technical computing concept here, um, we have very loose functional coupling. What I mean by that is, it just extends the thought I was just mentioning here, I can put this in any number of different places. It's not like this functionality is tied to just being used in this one context and this one piece of software. I can use this many, many, many places because it's not tightly coupled in. It's kind of the difference between a Lego piece that you, know, you can put a model together using that Lego piece or what I understand is some people, when they might make a Lego uh, whatever that they really, really like, they glue the pieces together. Well, once you glue the pieces together, you can't really take it apart and put it back together again. What I'm saying here is the pieces aren't glued together. We can take them apart, we can put them back together, and we can reconfigure this as we need to. The another benefit of this is I have a known good solution. If I want to look up customers' account numbers using their name and address, I know this will do it for me. I don't have to know what's in that box. I don't need to know how it works, but I know it does work. And so that is a known good solution to a problem, meaning I don't have to solve that problem for myself. And so that's a real benefit of this particular architecture. It allows, and I talked about this last time, allows the creation of composite applications. So when I'm a software developer and I think in terms of building a new piece of software, I no longer have to think in terms of writing all of the code from scratch. I can now think in terms of, okay, here's what I want my software to do, and I can use these existing services 
as a part of that. And then I just have to write the code maybe that connects those pieces together or does some other specialized thing that's unique to my application. But I can leverage these known good solutions to create these composite applications. And I think we observed last time that in SAP terminology, they refer to those as X apps. And this is a huge new uh, paradigm that SAP is following with their UI5 and HTML5 applications that, that they are rolling out now. It makes things a lot easier for developers. As I've already said, you don't have to know what's inside the black box to know how to use it. So it's an abstraction of complexity. I don't have to worry about it. I can just use it. I know how to call it. I know what to give it. I know what it gives me back. And I don't really have to dig down in that. It also allows me, as the service provider, <coughs> I can actually change the service code without disrupting overall application. Now what do I mean by that? Well, if the person who developed the composite application is operating from the understanding that I feed that black box a name and an address and it gives me back a customer account number, if I, as the service designer, decide to rewrite the code, as long as I follow that same, if you will, contract, as long as I set up my code to accept the name and the address, and I give back the account number and response, I could change what happens in that black box to make it more efficient or to accomplish some other goal that I'm shooting for here. And I can do that without breaking the overall application because it still operates fundamentally the same as it did before, but maybe now it gives back answers twice as fast. So there are a whole host of reasons of which this is just a sampling of why a lot of enterprise applications anymore <coughs> operate based on this paradigm, based on this architecture of a service-oriented architecture. And once again, just to be clear, the reason why it's called the service-oriented architecture is because we create a whole bunch of these services where the services fundamentally, you make a request of it, it sends you a reply. And it really is just a variation of what we are all used to when we sit down and use the World Wide Web. So how does that, any questions about that before we keep going here? So how does that work in terms of the overall SAP architecture? I mentioned to you previously that at the heart of our overall SAP architecture is NetWeaver. NetWeaver is kind of the technical foundation upon which everything is, is built. Well, this square here, this rectangle, illustrates the overall NetWeaver architecture. And we will not dig into it in great detail. But notice right here at the center, at the heart <coughs> of this, is this Enterprise Services Repository. And that Enterprise Services Repository is a collection of these web services that I can, I can call. Now, what makes this somewhat unique in the SAP architecture is, is notice this right here, design governance. Well, what does that mean? What that fundamentally means is I have in this repository a whole collection of web services. But these web services will operate consistently with how I have configured my system and designed my business processes. Let me give you an example. <coughs> Suppose I have a service called Cancel Order. And Cancel Order operates really, really simply. I pass in an order number, and it goes into the system, finds that order number, and cancels it. And it then responds either 
yes, I canceled it successfully, or no, I did not cancel it. Okay, really, really basic web service. So you understand the design of this service. You pass it an order number, and it cancels that order. Well, maybe I have set up my system such that there are times when I will not allow an order to be canceled. What would be a scenario under which I will not allow an order to be canceled? Shipped. It's already shipped out to the customer. You know, it can't do that. Once the order, and, and you know, that was one of those things where a lot of online companies in the early days you know, didn't really test out all the particular scenarios. And you could do that on some of them. A customer would place an order, they'd ship out the order, the customer would cancel it and never have to pay. But they got the stuff. So clearly, we don't want to allow a customer to cancel an order after it's already been shipped. So this service corresponds with our desired way to execute our business processes. So even though the service says, give me an order number and I'll cancel it, it will, as a part of its functionality, check to see whether the order, in fact, is able to be canceled or not. And if it's not, it'll respond, no, I, I did not cancel that order. So that's what we have going on here. We have this repository of services that do what we want, but at the same time, they uphold our desired way of executing our business processes. So that's at the heart of this. You'll notice down here at the bottom are all of the different applications that are providing these enterprise services. Down here, you know, this is the SAP Business Suite. So that's SAP ERP and CRM and all the things we talked about last time. There are other SAP NetWeaver applications, Master Data Management, Business Intelligence, and so on. These dots here are representing the interfaces there, the services they provide. I can also hook up other companies' applications into this NetWeaver <coughs> infrastructure, and they can put their services in my enterprise services repository. So the nice thing about this is whatever application I have hooked into the overall NetWeaver infrastructure, its services are going to populate into this enterprise service repository, and then I can use it in all kinds of different applications that I would create. I can use it in the SAP GUI. I could use it on a web portal. I can use it on a mobile device. I can use it uh, voice hasn't really got a lot of attention anymore um, as far as like people calling up over the phone. I can use it in search. There's all kinds of different ways in which I can use these applications, or excuse me, these services in different applications I create. And I showed you this picture last time as an example of that. This is a number of different services that have been hooked together for the sake of providing a dashboard type application for my organization. Any questions about service-oriented architecture? All right, we're going to change gears here, but question. Test your understanding. SAP R3 is most notably associated with which architecture? SOA, client server, or monolithic? What do you think? Client server is correct. R3 is associated with client server. Now, monolithic would be SAP System R or R1. R2 would also be monolithic. Uh, but R3 is the first time we saw the client server architecture debut. SOA showed up when we moved to SAP ERP, which is the product that followed R3. So hopefully you got that one. Client server, yay. Which of the following would not typically be associated with SOA? XML, HTTP, composition, tight coupling, or abstraction? Which one is this one? 
Tight coupling. Tight coupling, D type coupling. We use XML and HTTP for transmitting the information and for the actual data itself. Composition, we talked about the idea that we can use these services to compose bigger applications. Abstraction is the idea that we don't have to know how it does what it does, we just need to know what it does. But we said tight coupling, uh, we actually said that it is loosely coupled, meaning I can reuse these pieces <coughs> in many, many different contexts. It's not tightly coupled, it's not glued in to just one use in my overall system. All right, so we have now talked about the evolution of ERP architecture. Questions? Roger. Um, the idea of abstraction has a, I think has a flaw in that uh, maybe, say, for instance, you trust a service to do a certain thing for years and years, and, and uh, let's say that at some point the laws change to where uh, tax brackets or whatever has to do with taxes change, and we still use the same thing we've always used. No one cares because they don't care to go ahead and dig deeper and find out what it is. And so we see a chance of maybe shoot yourself in the foot there by the I'm glad you even used the example that you did, and, and for the sake of the recording, if anyone listens to it, Roger raised the question of, you know, how do we know that a service that we haven't used for a really long time doesn't just stop working or stop working correctly? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we know that we're going to consistently get the correct response if we don't really know how it does what it does? Well, one example of this that is fairly universal for businesses these days is, and I'll, I'll put this here. Um, this is an e-commerce example, but it would also be relevant in other contexts. Sales tax. Sales tax, which apparently you now spell with an X at the end of the word sales. Uh, sales tax is a pain in the neck, okay? Um, have you ever bought something online from a company and you go to check out and you put in your zip code and the website responds and says which county do you live in Sullivan or Washington County depending upon where you live you might have seen that question well, why do you get that question well sales tax is really really hard to compute if you're thinking in terms of creating an application that would allow you to sell across the entirety of the United States. And let's just think in terms of the United States right now. You know, you might live in Johnson City, Tennessee, and so you know the sales tax here, but what's the sales tax in San Diego? And does it vary depending upon what kind of product the customer is buying? And is it kind of like we see here where food is taxed one way but non-edible items are taxed another way? Tax codes are really, really, really complicated. It doesn't matter whether you work for Amazon or some really small fly-by-night company. Nobody wants to spend a lot of time worrying about tax codes. But the thing is, you've got to collect and pay sales tax or somebody's probably going to go to jail. So you don't want to have that happen. So what companies will do is they will pay money to an outside sales tax providing company. And typically what happens is that company then provides a set of services that we plug into our application and so when you check out even from Amazon Amazon sends a list of what you've ordered at least in terms of the product categories and sends your address to this sales tax service and it tells them how much you should actually pay in taxes now that is handled by Amazon and these other companies paying money to this third party company. This third party company, pretty much all they do is research tax laws. And they have a staff that is up to date. Anytime the tax laws change everywhere, they find out all the ins and outs of it, and they update the code that their company provides to make sure that customers are paid paying appropriate tax. If Amazon had to do this themselves, there's a chance that they might fall behind and not be operating on the most current information. But by hiring this other company that all they do 
is research and provide modules to compute sales tax, Amazon can feel pretty comfortable that they're going to do a good job because if they don't, they're going to go out of business and a competitor is going to replace it. So these services are often provided by companies with expertise in just a very select set of, of functionality. And their whole business is devoted to meeting contractual arrangements. You know, Amazon has a contract that says you can look up for us 10 million orders a day and you'll respond within half a second to any tax request we give you. And so, sure, things can and do break, but when there's money changing hands and when there's contracts on the line, it's usually in the service provider's best um, interest to keep everything up and operating. But you're right. Ultimately, uh, no pun intended, the buck stops with us. We've got to make sure that if we use a third-party service provider for this, that they are uh, doing what they're supposed to be. <coughs> Good question. Other questions? Okay, the next section of, of this that was covered in, I think, Chapter 2 in your textbook related to the core SAP ERP modules. We already talked about this. So you, you will see or you have seen uh, a table that looks very much like this in your textbook here that talks about the, the different core modules of the ERP system. And so I'm just reproducing it here for the sake of, of completeness. We have already talked about this in our last discussion. So we can put a check mark next to discussing the core modules in SAP ERP. Next item on the agenda here, SAP Business Suite, NetWeaver, and HANA. And, and we talked a little bit about this last time as well. We have this idea of SAP Business Suite, which combines SAP ERP, which is the core application in most companies' infrastructure, with other tools that provide additional transaction, additional <coughs> modules, if you will, additional services to the service repository. We have CRM, which is focused on our customer relationship, SRM, which is focused on our relationship with our supplier, product lifecycle management, which is lifecycle data, uh, quality management, asset management, added functionality in all of those domains, and then supply chain management, which gives us functionality for transportation, for inventory and warehouse management, and other things of that sort. The idea here is that uh, ERP systems are focused on allowing us to execute end-to-end -end business processes. So the more systems we add to our overall architecture, the more types of business processes we can actually accomplish that with. What I don't know that we talked about last time is the benefit that SAP Business Suite provides in terms of our being able to link up our operations with our suppliers. If we're the company in the middle and we are running supplier relationship management and one of our suppliers is also running SAP Business Suite, their CRM module and our SRM module can very, very nicely be hooked up together. And what this affords us now is this idea of we can, we're still thinking in terms of business processes, but instead of just being able to confine the execution of a business process to what happens within our organization, we can now think of a business process actually existing across our entire supply chain. So for example, what's very, very common for some kinds of products, and you see this a lot, with uh, convenience stores. There's something that is commonly done called vendor managed inventory. And in vendor managed inventory, the, the retailer doesn't really manage their own inventory. They trust the supplier to come in and put out the products and stock the shelves and other things of that sort. Great example of this in a grocery store is typically uh, soft drinks, 
will be vendor managed inventory as well as things like uh, chips and pretzels and things like that. <laughs> we would just call them snacks. And maybe you've been in a grocery store before when the Coke guy has been there restocking Coke on the shelves. Well, why does that happen? Why is it the Coke guy restocking the shelves? It's not like you go in and the ketchup guy is restocking the Heinz ketchup and then you go over to the fruit and a guy from the apple orchard is putting out the apples. No, the grocery store itself restocks those items, but for certain items, the grocery store basically says to the vendor, you come in and we're gonna allocate you this much shelf space, you figure out what you wanna put there and it works because the vendor wants the store to sell as much as possible. So the vendor and the store kind of cooperate and they let the uh, organization, they let the vendor decide what actually gets put out. So there's a real merit there in our computer system talking automatically to our vendor's computer system so that if we've done a lot of business today, the Coke guy can be alerted to the fact, hey, you need to come back and fill up the Coke again. I don't know if your experience differs from mine, but I've gone into stores before and wanted to buy a brand of toothpaste and they've been out of it. Or I've wanted to buy a kind of salad dressing and they're out of it. I've never gone into a store and had them be out of Coca-Cola. You know, it seems like they're always there. And I've gone into stores sometimes on Sunday and the Coke guy is there stocking the shelves on Sunday. Why is that? Well, it's because of this idea of vendor managed inventory. Whenever they run low, their supplier's automatically notified. He or she comes out and restocks the shelves because we both have the same goal, and that's to sell as much of that soft drink product as we possibly can. So what we're able to do now is we can think in terms of a business process doesn't start and end within the confines of just our company. It could actually start here with our supplier and then run into our organization and then even to our customers. For example, maybe Coca-Cola comes up with a new flavor and they might not even communicate to the retailer about that flavor. They just start putting it in the stores and customers start buying it and all of that just happens automatically. Now in my example, they probably would have to notify the vendor so that they can make sure it's set up in their cash register system and things like that. But if our computer systems are hooked together, even that can be automated. And so the idea here is we can use SAP Business Suite to establish this kind of highly integrated supply chain amongst our relationship with our vendors and our relationships with our customers. And the more efficient we can make this happen, we're driving out unnecessary costs and we're able to make sure that needs are met. We're able to minimize our inventory while at the same time making sure that we never run out. There's just a huge array of benefits that come with this kind of inter-business integration. And the idea here is, I certainly wouldn't say it's provided for free because everything up on that screen right there costs a lot of money. But one of the things that we get along with making this investment is the ability to support this kind of integration. Now, if my supplier doesn't run SAP, <coughs> so they don't have this, they might have an Oracle ERP system. My SRM software will still afford me the ability to interface with that Oracle system, but it may not be as tight an integration. I may not be able to do all of the things that I could do if we were running SAP with both us and our supplier. Any questions or comments about this? All right, the next slide. I can promise you will generate several questions on your midterm exam and on upcoming quizzes. And that is, let's talk for just a minute about NetWeaver. NetWeaver is a tool for providing integration. And back here on this last slide, I talked about the fact that we can hook our system up with our vendor, whether they're running an SAP system or an Oracle system. How do we do that? 
we do that through NetWeaver. NetWeaver is kind of the computing equivalent of a really, really complex set of plumbing supplies. And it lets us hook different pipes together so that systems can communicate with one another for the efficient exchange of information. And so maybe I'm running SAP, so I have, let's just say, the equivalent of two-inch pipes, and my vendor is running IBM, so they have one-and-a-half-inch pipes. Well, NetWeaver gives me the tools that I need to hook those two systems together and still have all the piping work out exactly like it should. So NetWeaver is this tool that gives us this ability to engage in integration. Now, the kinds of integration it supports are, are really, really interesting. And it's illustrated by this diagram that SAP uses in a variety of contexts that is often referred to as the NetWeaver fridge. And the reason there is, I suppose, you can envision that as a large refrigerator that you open up and it has different drawers or different shelves in it. Well, the NetWeaver fridge tells us that there are four primary elements that NetWeaver focuses on providing integration. It provides people integration, it provides information integration, it provides process integration, and then the last one is not a kind of integration, but it provides the technical infrastructure for us to do application development. So PIPA, remember that acronym or that mnemonic, if you will, but then more importantly, remember what it stands for, PIPA. People integration, information integration, process integration, and the underlying application platform. Now let's talk about that, but usually if you can remember PIPA, then you're in, you're in pretty good shape here. Well, first of all, uh, people integration. This is an area where SAP has been widely criticized, and I think deservedly so. It is kind of interesting that if we were to rewind five years ago, a lot of companies were very much focused on their, on their portal, their web portal, their intranet, their web-based system that they had set up to support communication within their organization. And a lot of organizations still use that kind of structure for communicating with their employees. The idea would be you go to work in the morning, you sign into the, your computer, and there's kind of a, a company intranet, a company portal, that you could maybe look up your payroll information, you could find out information about what's going on in the company, and a lot of those resources would be restricted just to you as an employee of that organization. Well, that's a portal site. The most common portal site that enterprises use today is what? Anybody know? What's that? All in. What? I'm sorry? The most common site. Most common portal site is what? I'm going to say SharePoint. SharePoint. SharePoint is made by Microsoft. So Microsoft has SharePoint that they came out as a portal tool. And the idea is that everybody in the company, secretaries, executives, people that work in the plant, uh, they could use Microsoft SharePoint to look up information. They could actually have information that they put out there, <coughs> libraries of shared documents and so on. Microsoft came out with SharePoint. SAP came out with their competitive product called Enterprise Portal. Here would be a challenge for you. Go to an SAP trade show and walk around for two days amongst the thousands of attendees and see if you hear anybody at any point say anything about Enterprise Portal. I'm going to bet that you won't because it is widely agreed that SAP Enterprise Portal is not worth talking about because it's just not a good product. So SAP kind of abandoned 
the portal idea, realizing that a lot of companies would want to run Microsoft SharePoint. And, and they can. You can run Microsoft SharePoint, hook it up to NetWeaver, and it'll let you deploy all of your SAP infrastructure into SharePoint. But part of NetWeaver is SAP Enterprise Portal. And here's how you know that SAP doesn't care about this product much anymore. You used to have to pay for it and license it as a separate application, and I'm pretty sure now you just get it for free when you buy NetWeaver. So when SAP decides to stop making money off of it, you know it's, it's just not that important to them. But one of the things that is provided by NetWeaver as a tool for for people integration is a lot of different applications and services that support letting people exchange information. This is everything from being able to set up <laughs> wiki sites that are web-based to setting up uh, electronic chat rooms to uh, video conferencing. NetWeaver can help with all of that. You can set up your company infrastructure so that NetWeaver is the tool that's driving your integration. The whole idea here is NetWeaver supports this multi-channel access so that you can have people using your SAP infrastructure through mobile devices, through tablet computers, through desktops, through PCs, you know, you name it. If they want to get access to SAP resources, they can do that using the people integration tools that are provided by SAP NetWeaver. The idea here, though, fundamentally, people integration means supporting communication from one person to another person. That's one of the pieces of NetWeaver that is available. But really, the next two, the I and the other P, are two of the more core pieces of integration. Information integration. We want to be able to easily exchange information amongst computer systems for the sake of engaging in business intelligence and data analytics. NetWeaver lets us do that. So notice off here to the right, we have .NET, which is Microsoft, we have WebSphere, which is IBM, and then we have dot, 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 which is anybody else with any old other thing. So NetWeaver gives us all of these connectors such that we can connect them up into our NetWeaver infrastructure. And so our SAP business intelligence tools can go into a Microsoft database for the sake of pulling out information and putting information in. It can use WebSphere to communicate with IBM DB2. So I can have a very diverse set of computer tools, but if I let NetWeaver drive and I hook all of these other tools up to NetWeaver, I've now connected the plumbing so that all of my computer systems can, can engage in information exchange with one another. <laughs> and how is that going to happen? Through NetWeaver's ability to facilitate information integration. So now, although I have different computer systems, I can use NetWeaver as a unifying tool. One example of that, that is very valuable in organizations is master data management. And I've used this example in some other classes, so you have to excuse me if, if, if you've heard this one before. But if I look in my IBM DB2 database, and I see a product there with the material number JJ-MR127, and then I look in my SAP ERP database and I see a product with a material number of JJMR1273. Well, the first question is, are those two products related? And is it possible even that that's the same product, just with slightly different codes in two different systems? We run into questions like this all of the time because companies can be somewhat sloppy in their coding and in their naming of things. You know, if you were inclined to say that these are two different products, suppose the textual description for this was work, glove, model, 
127, and the description of this guy down here was work glove model 127. You know, now you might be inclined to say, oh, well, I guess it is the same product, even though we're using slightly different codes and slightly different systems. From a database perspective, this is a nightmare, okay? This is an extremely common problem in organizations. And so what we have to have is we have to have a way of rationalizing this. We have to have a way of driving this out of our infrastructure so that every system we have, even though some of it might be from different vendors, every system is using the exact same codes for the exact same thing. That is master data management. And that is a function that SAP NetWeaver can provide for us. And it is something that is very uh, frequently focused on in contemporary IT infrastructures. So NetWeaver provides people integration, it provides information integration, and then it provides process integration. So the idea that I have various systems Maybe a system that's a part of the SAP business suite. Maybe it's a system from another vendor. And it can trigger the start of a business process. You know, I can be told to buy something by an IBM WebSphere uh, software product. I can be told to buy something from a vendor's product that's a whole different kind of application than we've ever even talked about here. That's process integration. And NetWeaver allows us to hook together these processes through its, whoops, I didn't mean to black that out, I meant to highlight it, through its ability to engage in playing the role of integration broker. <coughs> it sits there, and if needed, it can translate from one system to the other. It can say, okay, this system's calling it a JJ-MR127, but we call it this. And so it can, it can translate back and forth. Great example of this that I don't know that you will see in your lab work or have ever seen before, but you can set up SAP to take orders for products in your customer's material number. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we universally call this work glove right here JJMR1273 and all of our internal systems. But our customers contacted us and said, you know, to make our life easier, when we send you a purchase order, we just want to call this work glove 127. And so when you get a PO from us, and it says on there that we want a thousand work glove 127s. This is what we mean, but nowhere will this code actually appear on our purchase order. And so we set up our system, very, very easy to make this happen, to accommodate a customer actually ordering their material number, but we translate it when it goes into our system. And by the way, we can track it internally this way for our processes, but when we print out the invoice, the invoice will say work glove 127 so that there's no confusion. That's an example of the process integration functionality provided by NetWeaver. So we have people integration, information integration, process integration, and then the last piece here, application integration. And this is where NetWeaver allows us to come along and write our own applications. And we've talked about this <coughs> that you can do SAP development in ABOP. You can also do SAP development in this right here, which is what? What is that? J2EE. -E. What's that more commonly called? Nobody knows what that's a reference to? Java. Java. So you can do SAP development in Java. And then this database and operating system abstraction means that you can actually run NetWeaver on Windows, on Linux, on Unix, and a handful of other operating systems. And the core database could be an IBM DB2 database. It could be a Microsoft SQL Server. It could be SAP HANA. It could be any number of other databases. And 
from the end user's perspective and in terms of the functionality afforded to the other parts of the fridge here, it all behaves exactly the same. <coughs> because NetWeaver does whatever translation is necessary on its own. So if we send a command to the operating system, even something simple like what time is it, that's usually a, a functionality provided by the operating system. The command to get that might be different whether we're running Windows or Linux. We don't have to worry about that. Um, we just you know, rely on, on NetWeaver to automatically get that information because it knows what operating system it works on. So PIPA, people integration, information integration, process integration, and then the underlying application platform. Questions about any of this? I'll go back to one thing that I mentioned before to reiterate here. This enables what SAP calls their enterprise services architecture. <coughs> which is one of their big selling points. It's the idea that if you will let NetWeaver drive, when you hook up these other applications, you don't have to worry about one of these other applications doing something that is inconsistent with how you want to run your company. You know, we hook our system up to one of our suppliers. Or better yet, we hook our system up to one of our customers so that our customers can place orders with us. And we want that to happen because it allows us to service our customers much more efficiently. But what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to send the customer a quote that says, if you buy WorkGlove 127s from us, the price is going to be $12.70 per unit. And then they try and place an order and it goes into our system with a unit price of $1.27. So the idea here is their system and our system are hooked together, but our system is going to make sure that as there's information exchanged and as there's different things being done, that nothing is being done inconsistent with the way we have set up things to operate. That's called this enterprise services architecture, which is, as it says here, it's a bundle of ERP functionality that deploys our business functionality, all of our services, while still enforcing our business rules. So that's the real compelling argument for why an organization would want to go this direction. Somebody's got to be in charge, or some technology has to be in charge, and so we use NetWeaver, it lets us hook all of these systems together and enforces the integrity of how we want to do our business processes. Now you look at this and you say, that seems like it's probably somebody's full-time job just to keep NetWeaver up and running. And depending upon the size of your organization, that may be several people's jobs. They fulfill the role of what's commonly seen in advertisements as a uh, NetWeaver administrators. In some organizations, they still use really, really old terminology. Before NetWeaver branded a lot of this as being a part of NetWeaver, they referred to this kind of foundational infrastructure as basis. And so you'll see job ads out there now for basis administrators. Same idea, just old terminology versus new terminology. And these are going to be the people that keep our system up and running, that keep it performance tuned, that make sure that as new systems come up, they're <coughs> properly configured in the system, they monitor performance, all kinds of things that fall under the umbrella of this. And by the way, something that we have not mentioned, but is a huge focus of this, is security because you can bet that if you're hooking these different systems together and we're talking about sharing information with other organizations that there's information that we want to share and there's information that we don't want to share. And so all of that is going to be managed and mediated and controlled and audited by the NetWeaver infrastructure. 
Questions? Now, I have a slide here about HANA but I don't want to jump into it right now. So for the moment, we're going to bypass HANA and do another one of our test your understanding questions. Which of the following does SAP Business Suite enable for inter-business connectivity? SRM to CRM, PLM to CRM, ERP to CRM, PLM to SCM. Now, before you answer, let me mention that this right here is probably the key word in this question. So we're focused here on connecting one business to another business. Clearly, SAP Business Suite allows us to connect ERP and CRM, but that's within a single business. So that would not be the correct answer here. Who can tell us what the correct answer is? A. Uh, we can hook our supplier relationship management to another company's customer relationship management for the sake of, of exchanging information and making our supply chain operate much more efficiently. Any questions about that? Which of the following is not a key point of integration supported by NetWeaver? A, people, B, product, C, process, D, information. And, and I like to ask this question like this because if all you know is PIPA, you're in trouble now, okay? Because it's not like one of them is, you know, computers and you, you, know, you know, well, that's the wrong letter. So which of these is, is not a focal element of NetWeaver integration? Product, product. We provide people integration, we provide process integration, we provide information integration. Product integration is kind of inherent in some of those things, but it's not one of the key <coughs> focal elements. Um, business intelligence is supported by which integration facet of NetWeaver? People, product, process, or information? Which one is that? It is D, it's information. Why is that? Well, business intelligence, in order to do that, we have to pull together all of the information available to us across disparate computer systems. And so the information integration facet of NetWeaver allows us to gather all of that information together for the sake of supporting BI. We didn't answer this question right here, so we will just skip over it for now. So, we have now talked about ERP architecture evolution. We've talked about the core modules. We've talked about SAP Business Suite. And um, we are getting ready to talk about the classes of data in our ERP system. We only have about two minutes left. So rather than jump into that, um, are there any questions or comments about any of the things that we talked about today? Anything that would be helpful for us to take, say, a minute and, and go back through real quick? Yes, ma'am. Is there any reason you don't have this PowerPoint on D2L? I think I do. It seems like other people have it. So I mean, I, I have it, but it's just different. It doesn't have the questions in it. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have the questions because I want you to be surprised by those when right. they show up. Yeah. But I think it... It's got like a one, one slide that's duplicated like four times on it. Really? Yeah, the topics do become. Oh, well, it's because I put that between every one of the topics. That's the same way in my slide set here. But I think uh, sometimes I do go back in and update slides. Um, so that may happen. And then sometimes I pull slides out like I do with the question ones because I want people to see them for the first time when we're together. Uh,